business rescue practitioners, the BRPs, have been on top of this uh, for quite a while. The unions have resisted the changes that were supposed to be made. Well, wh where are we going to get the $10.5 billion from? So again, no one seems to have shown any interest. Why? Well, it's because of the way the, air the airline has been run. Uh, it's ha South African Air Air Airways has not been profitable since 2011 which is very interesting. Since 2011 was the last record low for employed people in South Africa. It all, it all ties together. So we're awaiting Clive uh, Ramatibella, who is hopefully going to be joining us to discuss it. But again, let's look at these, uh, those uh, unemployment numbers, because here's the impact now. If South African Airways cannot get that 10.5 billion rand, then these numbers are going to, they'll go up. These numbers go up, right? Um, now, South African areas, of course, aviation sector, so that's part of the formal sector. So, uh, okay, well, it goes up by how much? I think it's about 10,000 10, uh, people uh, as far as jobs that are linked, five, between five, five and a half to, to 10,000 jobs linked to uh, South African Airways. Why won't anyone uh, bring forth that 10.5? Okay, well, okay, we've got Clive. We've got Clive Ramatibella joining us now. I think, Clive, you're welcome to the Global Business Report. I was just going through uh, the myriad of issues. You're welcome uh, to the Global Business Report on Arise News. Going through the myriad of issues that South Africa is going through right now. Let's start with um, unemployment, yeah? Uh, so, Clive, the number of people with jobs dropped to a, uh, no, a low not seen since uh, 2011. But unemployment also dropped from 30% to 23%. Uh, how does that, that work out? Don't be misled by economic jargon, my friend. <laughs> I hope you're well and you're beautiful. So, so obviously you know that there's a difference in definition in terms of uh, what is defined as real unemployment numbers, and then there's an expanded definition of what is unemployment numbers. What we see in the quarter, in the second quarter, it would be great to celebrate the 23.3% uh, unemployment rate. But the truth of the matter is, is that we had an influx of a number of people, close to about half a million people who stopped actively looking for work. Uh -huh. One, because of the COVID-19. And two, because of obviously inactivity under the lockdown level five. Three, because of the fact that factories were not open. So that lockdown ultimately meant that people could not continue to work. So so the definition in itself gives an indication whether or not these numbers are solid or not. Unfortunately, they still paint a dire picture. And to be low uh, as 2011, it's great, but not in this current circumstance, because what it really means is that we've had more people losing jobs in the last quarter than we've had over a period of the last nine years. That is not impressive. Okay, Facey, thank you. That's, that's why we have you on the show. So if you include the people who have stopped looking for work but are actively able to work, then Clive, this thing goes up to what, 40%, 42, 45? 42%, 42% that's what uh -huh. the, the, the that percentage should be. And if, by the way, just to remember as well, this is very important, the collective number, the data that is utilized, I've been arguing uh, with our statistician general uh, for a long time, even the previous one, that the collective number that they utilize, it does not include people who define themselves as unemployment. Remember, statistics are, are literally surveys. So they do look at the numbers from the banks, obviously people who have bank accounts. They do look at people who are active in the economy. They do look at people uh, payroll numbers, people who are getting paid, those who are paying UIF, which is the unemployment employment insurance uh, 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 fund, and also people who are paying VAT and pay-as-you-go, which is the uh, uh, pay-as-you-earn, which is the PAYE. Those collective group of people might be actively working, but the workforce of South Africa, I reckon, is sitting at around 23 million. And currently, we are just working on an 18 million assumption that that's what the economy is consuming, because we're not counting other people who define themselves as unemployed, yet are active in the economy. Uh, sister uh, Google, who sits on the side corner, who sells bananas and cash cabbages and so forth is not counted because he she gets her money cash and she uses her money cash and therefore there's no correlation that the statistician can actually pick up on whether or not that person participates in the economy it's the fraud idea of these kind of principles that we've been utilizing economic data that we've 
literally copied from the West and have not implemented our own. And that is why the Chinese model is slightly different because they calculate what the model it is that reflects true reflection of what China is. And it's the same in South Africa. If, if we could do that for Africa and South Africa, where we calculate the actual impact because those people are, are active in the economy, but not as active to be actually calculated as part of an unemployment or employment ratio that is calculated by the statistician general. Clive, as we uh, as we say in Nigeria, you're, you're shaking a lot of tables here. This is you know it's this has an impact on how one does calculate the unemployment rate. I'm thinking of your labor force is 20, anyway. I'm not going to get into Nigeria. Your labor force is just 23 million. You're looking at a 42 percent unemployment rate. We have a labor force. So let me let me leave that alone. Let me ask you about the unemployment insurance uh, fund. Are you satisfied with the level of support that is given to unemployed South Africans so far, or is the fund too small? Does it need to be expanded? Uh, how does that look? That was meant to be uh, helping those people who uh, we described there in that ratio, in that uh, statistic as unemployed, who, who subsequently lost their jobs because of the pandemic or who stopped working because of the pandemic. And also the sm small, medium enterprises and big business, we must be honest, they also pay UIF. They have a right to obviously uh, claim against it. That 500 billion rand that we have spoken about before that was allocated to different parts of the economy to try and stabilize it, but also to and try and make sure that the impact of the uh, of the pandemic is not to the effect that it hurts South Africans, uh, South Africans in the pockets and the economy at large, has been in the newspapers. And you know we've spoken about it, the corruption that has taken place, the bad, bad maladministration, people who are dead, 15,000 people were paid who have been declared dead by Home Affairs were paid the UIF. People who are children as young as 15 uh, have been paid the UIF. Where did they get the records? We don't know. Things like that is what makes it so difficult for this country to move forward and get economic prosper prosperity. So why has this not been taken care of? Well, we know that the minister actually took action and fired some of the uh, uh, director generals in his own department to, to try to get rid of people who were mismanaging that money. But it's a continuous problem when it comes to these type of things where you find corruption raising its ugly head. And unfortunately, the people who get hurt are the South Africans, the work, hardworking and taxpaying South Africans who have earned their right to get that type of relief. Unfortunately, that money has not been uh, 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 administered properly. And so, yes, we there are people who did get that money. It did help. And you can see it because even in the guarantees, my brother, that were given to the banks so that they can help small business, not everybody claimed. So of the 2 billion rand that was set aside for that, only 146 million rand has been asked in terms of loan loans to actually assist small business. So small business is even scared to borrow money from government because they know that they'll get themselves into more debt and into more trouble. So, yes, there is up to some extent it has helped, but unfortunately it has done very little to take us away from the economic disaster that we're facing. And that's why, in actual fact, even Moody's has raised concerns about how this is all going to pan out because we might be looking at another downgrade, uh, now from junk to even more junk uh, from Moody's uh, before the end of next month. Oh, dear. All right. Thank you for that, uh, Clive. Speaking of uh, corruption issues, um, the unions and ESCOM, uh, the union asking for the board of ESCOM to be fired, to quit because of a probe into the chief operating officer. How's, how's that coming along uh, with regards to that push? It is a difficult conversation to have when you have a struggling uh, power utility that is in debt, that is struggling to keep lights on in South Africa, that is continuously having to fight not just its own shareholders, but corruption within its own stake itself. And also you have a union that has a mandate to its own members and it has made promises and guarantees that they should be able to be looked after. Unfortunately, because of the pandemic, uh, the, the resources that have been utilized to try and curb this particular pandemic have affected even the utility itself. And so what you find is that there's no common ground that the union can find with ESCOM or its employer. Why is that? This has never been sorted out. The industrial action that we continue to see in South Africa, whether it be in the services industry, whether it be in the financing industry, whether it be on, 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 on agricultural matters, 
All these things are a bad effect. It shows that there's no common ground that can be found, even with institutions that are supposed to be communicating to each other to make this possible. So what is happening is that the union has is, is saying to ESCOM that you have guaranteed us this particular negotiation that we will get this much amount of money in terms of increases in wages, and now you're saying you're turning your, 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 your back on us because of the pandemic, which is a true sense of what's happened. It's reality. Yes, we are facing a pandemic. But because you don't teach your, your unions, you don't teach your members, and you've given them guarantees, unfortunately, if anything has to be taken out of this, is that you will lose membership as union because if they don't, be, if they don't come to some sort of a solution, that means that their membership will go down because people will lose their jobs. So they're caught, they're caught between a rock and a hard place, my friend. They have to decide whether the goodness of all people working is not is, is as important as making sure that they get the big cuts in terms of wage increases uh, that will come from ESCOM. It's a difficult conversation, and you and I can sit out for, for the whole evening, uh, afternoon, talking about it, because it's a real tough discussion to have. Yeah, yeah. But, but let me tell you this. If, if unions can do better to educate their members and take them into confidence that when t times are tough, when economic times are tough, then they should be able to understand that the company can't actually pay out. We might have better understanding, but now we don't have that, and that's why they're demanding the increases. Clive Ramathibela, thank you so much. I wanted to get into South African Airways, but uh, we'll have to leave that for another time. That's another difficult conversation. Thank you so much for taking us through what's going on with unemployment and also with ESCOM.